Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Beth uh, Namachavaya. Um, I'm really excited to see everyone here today and hope that um, in the session this afternoon, we can actually move through our presentations and have some time uh, to talk about um, this idea of um, uh, research libraries, uh, scholarly communications, and digital scholarship and the ways in which it's evolving. If you can't hear me, raise your hands in the back or touch your ear and, and I'll try to speak uh, more loudly. I'm just going to quickly introduce um, uh, everyone on the panel. There are two presentations this afternoon, um, a presentation um, from the University of Illinois and a presentation from Emory University. Um, the first presentation um, will be um, myself and my colleague Rebecca Bryant uh, from the University of Illinois. The second presentation will be um, made by Wayne Morse, who is the co-director of the Emory Center for Digital Scholarship. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, at the University of Illinois, uh, we've been partnering with campus leadership to offer a suite of services that focus on helping scholars work more efficiently and effectively in a rapid, rapidly evolving research environment. And this presentation describes um, the newly formed um, Library Office of Research, the impetus for establishing that office and the campus-wide services that are being shaped by um, a group of uh, talented library professionals um, who work at in the Library of Illinois, along with scholars um, across the campus. One of the things um, that I think is, is really an important part of this evolving, um, really fluid uh, atmosphere is this idea of um, developing a framework that is shareable, that is generalizable, um, that we as a community um, of professionals can, can use as we work with scholars because this is really integral to what libraries, um, the services that libraries provide um, in, in a research environment. Uh, so the, the framework for action, which is what uh, we're, we're calling it, um, is something that, that we've shaped pretty much through our, our experience um, with the foundation rationale that researchers are really central to this effort. Um, and, and also with the drivers that we need to understand the context in which we're working. Um, we need to analyze or assess how we can be better aligned with that, how we can be better aligned with the evolving scholarship mission, what's the institution's strategy around this, and, and how do we participate in that as an, an organization engaged in academic, um, in, in, the, uh, in academia. Um, and um, we can reflect um, the, what we learn about assessing where we are um, through translational activities um, that are essentially our services and programs, um, our opportunities to work with scholars um, throughout the organization um, to move their, uh, their research forward um, and to preserve it, to provide access to it, um, and to create new scholarship. So putting this into action as a case study that we describe when we propose this session, um, we looked at the institutional context. Um, the University of Illinois, um, and you can see our lovely um, quad on the sort of the, in the heart of campus, um, is a land-grant institution. Um, it's one of three campuses, but this is the flagship campus um, established in 1867 uh, as a land grant and um, referred to in our strategic plan as a preeminent public research university with a land grant mission and a global impact. Um, we looked at this, um, but we also thought about the fact that um, in driving new service development, um, we, we began um, looking a little bit deeper. And um, this is actually a slide that's a bit doctored from our office of um, the Vice Chancellor for Research um, that essentially um, 
looks at Illinois, um, looks at the, the student and the scholarly makeup, uh, faculty, graduate students, and undergrads, um, the uh, fact that there is a, a very um, sort of decentralized campus structure with a number of colleges, over 150 programs of study, um, a, a, an R1 institution, um, research intensive by the Carnegie classification, and um, something that we've added here is the fact that there are over 6,500 articles published that were indexed in Scopus in 2013 at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. These sorts of things start to click into focus for us in the library as we begin to think about how does the scholarly communication, um, how does the scholarly communication process link into the way the campus um, looks at itself um, in terms of um, of its profile and its its re valued research output. So in 2014, um, University Library um, proposed an administrative restructuring late in the year that focused on calibrating responsibilities across several areas of the library organization. Um, part of that allowed us to integrate technology throughout what we did in the whole organization. Another part of the reorganization um, established the Office of Research in the library to align more directly with the campus's research intensive focus. We could see that this was an important element in our growing interactions with the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research. Um, we had already begun to partner with them and with the Office of the Provost and the Chancellor to establish um, a research data service. Um, and we were also approached by the Vice Chancellor for Research to establish a researcher information uh, system um, which would serve the whole campus. Further, um, in 2015 uh, and 2016, um, as the library developed a strategic framework um, for um, action, which essentially fuels our programs and decision-making processes, we've identified um, five areas in which um, the library's Office of Research uh, is actively um, working, uh, working across the library and across campus. Uh, and some of these we're still working on. So for instance, systemize the pr procedures for developing essentially teams to support research. Um, a lot of these things like uh, teams develop um, in a very fluid and dynamic way. And, and suddenly you might find three or four library staff who are working with a group of faculty and other researchers on a project. Um, and it's all very organic but we realized that we really need to develop ways to uh, stimulate this work, but also to track it within the organization so that we have a really good sense of, of what we're doing and, and how we're allocating our resources. We also focused on um, aligning, um, aligning our service planning um, in identifying the areas of the Office of Research um, that we, um, that, that exist now. And essentially um, focus that um, using four organizing principles to help scholars uh, create, manage, use, and publish information, um, to provide instruction and training in using um, digital scholarship technologies and methods, um, to share those best practices especially in scholarly communications, um, and to build uh, research-focused partner partnerships, um, working with our um, partners on campus. Um, now, my colleague Rebecca Bryant is going to step in and talk about um, the Office of Research and Programs and Service Areas. Okay. So hi, again, my name is Rebecca Bryant, and I'm the Visiting Project Manager for Research Information Systems at Illinois. And um, I'm going to talk with you a, a little bit about how all of these goals and vision um, and is starting to um, sort of gel and become a reality at Illinois. You can look at it this way. I'm actually going to, you know, that we have sort of five programmatic areas under the Office of Research Library 
Here's sort of a different look at it. Um, and I'm going to go back to the first slide. <coughs> Keep this in mind, though, because I think that you know part of one of the themes I want to communicate is that there's potentially a lot of different brands here, and that you know that the communication of what we're doing it actually has a lot of benefits by talking about it within one unit. So there are basically five programmatic areas. I'm going to specifically talk about four today. Our Digital Scholarship Center, the Scholarly Commons, the development of a research data service, researcher information systems, which is my area, and then also the emerging area of scholarly communications and publishing within the library. Um, and we're thinking very much of this as an emerging um, service category for, um, for, for libraries um, and that we believe there are a lot of synergies by situating these together and by in the future taking advantage of ways to communicate about these together. Um, they're also all, as you can begin to see here with Scholarly Commons, a theme throughout all of these is that they're also things that we're doing in close partnership with others across campus. The Scholarly Commons is our local name for our Digital Scholarship Center. It's been around for about four years. Uh, is that about right? Yeah. And um, it, we have a public space on the third floor of our main library. And the goal is there to facilitate research, primarily among grad students and faculty, but also among undergrads, uh, and all sorts of things that are available to users who come to that space, support with um, geospatial information, um, data visualization, um, research data, copyright, all sorts of things, survey research, working with large data sets, all sorts of things that researchers in um, a digital environment may need support with. And there, the website is there as well. Lots of workshops, lots of training, lots of individual advising on these topics as well. Second area uh, that, that is actually getting to be close to two years old in its emergence is our research data service. And this is a nice follow-up from the comments from Victoria Stodden just now related to um, responding to the OSTP memo and responding to the need to, to help support and to educate our researchers on good data practices to help them uh, create data man management plans, to help them become um, good stewards of that information, and to also provide a repository for the long-term curation and management of that information. So you can see the website there. Um, also, this is to emphasize that this is something that is not simply a library initiative. We have multiple partners on this specific project. Uh, lots of support from the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research, but also working with our campus uh, IT, working for the National Center for Supercomputing um, <coughs> Applications, NCSA, uh, Graduate School Library of Information Science, as well as the Provost Office. There are a lot of stakeholders in this issue. The library is providing the main home the main uh, support and continuing guidance and expertise in this area, but it is not something that we're doing unilaterally. We're doing this as parts of a larger university community. And that project is less than two years old. The first two years have spent hiring staff, developing strategic planning, beginning to also develop our own local um, data bank or repository, which will launch in the next four to eight weeks probably. We also have researcher information management systems, and so this is the area that I'm currently working in. And our goal within this is to provide um, greater collaboration to help support interdisciplinary research, to provide a central database or portal for faculty to go and find partners. Uh, and because we're a huge population of researchers on campus, it can be very hard to find somebody on the same campus who may do, be doing complementary research. Uh, because they might not be in your department, they may not be in your college. We have probably a dozen different units that do some sort of biological research. It can be really complex. You may not have any way of knowing except by going to this, this service. This is something we 
our faculty have asked for, and this is, we are responding to this. I think it's also a really important part of what universities need to be doing for reputation management as well, to serve as a showcase, not only internally, but that it's also a central place that others looking to learn about the Illinois campus can come for information about what are the areas of research productivity and expertise on the Illinois campus. Uh, and so we're working collaboratively again with the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research, who's providing um, a great deal of financial support for this product project. We are using the Elsevier Pure uh, Research Information Management System as our basis for this. Our effort here is intended to be comprehensive of all tenure line faculty on campus, as well as the many non-tenure track researchers who also live in institutes like the National Center for Supercomputing Applications or our Prairie Research Institutes uh, and or our Beckman Institute. Interdisciplinary um, and um, including the humanities, social sciences, as well as engineering and, and, and hard sciences. We launched in beta in 2015, and here's a website that can direct you to that. Delighted to talk with you more ab about this. I'm very excited about this project. And here's the, the last area I'm gonna specifically talk about, and that is scholarly communications and publishing. This is our newest effort to emerge, although parts of it have been here for some time. The part that is sort of pre-existing and that we're looking to grow upon is our ideals institutional repository. So that has been there. But in addition, we're looking to develop scholarly publishing services and support in the library to help support and develop awareness and efforts for open access publishing. And also then to hire additional expertise related to educating our community about copyright, author rights, fair use, et cetera. Uh, and so that is, that again is our newest area. We just hired the project lead for that uh, over the summer and we're beginning to grow that effort. I can't yet point you to a specific website for that, but that is something we're very excited to continue to grow. So part of, part of this um, is that I've mentioned the importance of collaboration across campus, but I think one of the things that's also really difficult is that our faculty, our grad students, and the administrators who we desperately need to partner with to serve our researchers may not think of the library as a place where these services live. Um, they, and especially at a place like Illinois where we have these amazing collections, they think of us as collections. And so I had a conversation not long ago with someone in our vice president's office about what I'm doing and she said, well, the library seems like a really strange place for that to live. And I'm like, let me tell you all the reasons why the library is the perfect place for this <laughs> initiative to live. So we continue to hear this a lot. And so we are at the early point as these things develop to develop communications under this Office of Research umbrella and reach out to numerous stakeholder groups. So here on the left, include continuing to engage our Vice Chancellor for Research and the units under it. The Graduate College, I think that especially reaching out to early career researchers, um, these things, they should start their professional careers with a strong understanding of these things. It is essential for their success in the profession. Working with the provost's office, especially as we see more maturity with things related to altmetrics and other sorts of things, undergraduate research, as well as the research deans across campus. I think a big challenge for us is also working on consistent messaging that they can think of, you know, instead of thinking of all of these different things, you know, um, the research data service, Illinois Research Connections, that they begin to see that the library is the home for a suite of services that serve researchers and that that is part of our mission. That includes one of our first part is just beginning to plug researchers into what are the 10 things you need to know as a researcher and how can the library help you. So this is a continuing effort for us and I think one of our greatest challenges. So here's our contact information. Please feel free to email us or tweet us. Uh, and I'm, at that point, I'm gonna wrap up uh, and then turn it over um, to Emory.
glasses on and I might see. <laughs> Thank you very much. Again, I'm Wayne Morris from Emory University. Um, I'm going to go through um, some information about what our center does. We're just about to celebrate our third year anniversary um, as a formal center and try to tie it in with my colleagues' work on framework because when we first stuck, got together and started talking about the presentation, we came up with a whole list of things that both institutions, although very different, were similar in how we tried to um, address them. Briefly, I'll go back. I'll try to do an adaptation on the Lawrence Lessig method here and go through some back story very, very quickly. Um, get into some key factors and some shared hypotheses that we did with one of our colleague universities um, in Atlanta. And then talk specifically about three types of frameworks, all of which are interconnected on how we operate, both externally, internally, and what we're calling modern scholarship, is really trying to look forward not only support today's, but also the future of scholarship. Just wanted to go quickly back, and uh, we were part of the, of the workshop in St. Louis a few years ago. Um, the key parts of this, I think, that we live by is that the difference between digital scholarship center as listed here and digital humanities is that wider set of clientele, service mission, and a broader disciplinary focus, more of a focus out than focus in, if you will. Uh, and we very much live live by that. So this is who we are. This is our website. You can go and you can see some of the key areas. Um, it's digitalscholarship.emory.edu or ecds.emory.edu. And we'll make these slides available afterwards. You can see some of our areas of focus. I'm just going to go through real quickly on publication, research, and even pedagogy. Uh, and also we have to be a resource center, as all of these uh, entities are. This is our mission statement that was re-edited by our entire team. Um, and you can see up here it talks about serving faculty, students, and staff, much like my colleagues. Um, get digital tools into their work. And really, our staff is made up of 10 FTEs, um, three librarians, and uh, seven full-time you know, technologists. And we have 25 graduate students on our payroll. Um, and uh, without them we could not operate and I'll talk about them later uh, and also the idea of we have my co-director is full-time tenured faculty in the history department so it's great that we can tag team on a lot of the challenges we get um, specifically around research but also around pedagogy so we came from five groups that were put together back in 2013 um, some of these were which were in existence from the mid 90s um, the text analysis shop was the early 90s the digital pedagogy shop was mid 90s um, and they brought us all together actually our enterprise CIO and vice provost Rich Mandola brought us together and 2013 to try to create a point of resource for researchers and for um, faculty who are teach and also graduate students who are teaching so this is our space this is from the outside looking in. You can see it's very transparent, purposefully so. Um, you can't see quite in this slide as it's projected, but we have some definitions, words on our windows about what all we do and what you can find inside. Uh, our prime location is in the main library on campus, third floor, um, and we believe that's integral to the successes we had. Uh, we don't expect people just to walk right in and say, help me with my research project, although they do. Uh, but just being there sends a sense of purpose around digital scholarship that everyone who walks down the third floor, which is the primary path, sees. Here's our layout. Um, from coming in down kind of mid, mid left is our entryway, but the outside along the curved space, those are our outside windows, those are all our full-time employees um, and librarians, FTEs and librarians. Those middle ones in kind of the blue are our public workstations. We have some meeting spaces, one we call the aquarium, which literally is, you can see from all sides. Um, we have some, an area that um, a group of graduate students publish Southern Spaces, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, a peer-reviewed open journal, scholarly journal. We also have an AV studio uh, to do um, voiceover recordings and um, animations. Uh, and we've just recently, not on this graph, um, added about a 20 by 10 space for our digital lab, uh, which are newly hired 3D 
uh, PhD is in helping us visualize things. So let's look from the inside. You can see it's very open. It's very different than some traditional spaces we see in the library, um, and purposefully so. Uh, we build it so people would overhear each other's comments. You can see there's several sets of headphones in that picture, which is our adaptation. We had to grow to be able to handle that. But we want the GIS librarians to overhear what the, what, what the text analysis people are doing. We want these purposefully, uh, these purpose, kind of purposeful interactions to happen. Um, in some cases, it was a huge transition for, for, for people. I'm not going to lie. But um, three years in, it's worked, it's worked very, very well. So some of the work we do, and I'll try to go quickly through these. Um, the Atlanta study site is a place where articles about Atlanta, including all types of media, come together. Uh, they have an Atlanta symposium, um, and it really brings the focus of the study of Atlanta together. This is one of our most recent projects, taking uh, re uh, recreating 1928 downtown Atlanta using Unity 3D engine. And behind all these structures are all the city directories, the data from the city directories, tens of thousands of entries um, going down to where, you know, we have maps too that show where the manhole covers are. We have, we have ethnicity of where people lived, which is all part of this, the city directories. Um, and this is an effort to uh, focus on public scholarship, really to bring di different types of ways to interact with scholarship and scholarly data that you can never get by just looking at um, thousands of lines of code of the city directories. Southern Spaces, as I mentioned, is that peer-reviewed graduate student-led journal, um, open access, really uh, they've been in existence now for 12 years, doing some dynamic things with um, media and um, uh, incorporating very, very um, interesting issues of the South. Uh, we also have um, a journal that's in, based on science, too. We met with the physical therapists, and they wanted to do a journal on the humanity aspect of what they do, really how to do, how the caregivers survive. Um, and it was very, very fascinating, and this is one of the, one of the ones. We don't do too many for the, for the medical sciences, but this was one that, that we did do. This I entitled more re research because it was traditional research. It was a new faculty member in art history. This is their area of expertise. Uh, was just hired. I happened to talk with her at the new faculty orientation three years ago. She's built this site. She's got three more grants to help build it out more. She's been invited to go to workshops. Uh, and we just finished a three month long hosting of five different speakers about mapping that she's paid for out of the monies that she's received. So she's really the superstar, and we just are there to help facilitate uh, by helping her visualize with maps and with a platform, in this case WordPress, to get her message across to her collaborators and to other, other researchers. We also do digital pedagogy. This is a program we do during the summer to help faculty learn all these tools, not only to do their research, but their teaching. Um, and it's been, a very, it's been in existence for over um, 12 years now, uh, of course, changing with the tools and changing with the, with the environment. And this is the one I wanted to kind of end on as far as our showcase. Uh, this was a faculty member who did research on um, unsolved and un unpublished murders in the South and um, Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, and he decided to bring students in to the work. So what he's done is he's, we're teaching his students on how to look at primary research, how to add and contribute to articles. Um, and I was just telling my colleagues up here, they just recently found a grave of a man who was who was hung and his, his daughter never knew where the grave was. And his students are out and they uncover it and it's a hand scratched name in a piece of concrete where he's buried. And uh, it, it, it got some press, but it was just fascinating to hear her comments about what, what this has done for her. But this is getting students, undergraduates in this case, access to uh, primary research and really building that basis, which I kind of put this as the kind of the gold standard of what, of what we're aiming at, blending research and uh, pedagogy together. So that was the background. Um, fast forward a little bit to last year when we partnered with our wonderful colleagues at Georgia State. They have this great facility, um, which I'm very envious of, this giant visualization space. But when we got together to talk, um, we thought, well, you know, we, we didn't have a space until late, and they had this wonderful space, and we have all these faculty projects that have gone forever, and they're developing new faculty projects. 
so there wouldn't be a lot that we could have in common. Um, it would be kind of hard pressed to find some, some continuities between our paths. And what we turned out to find was just the opposite. There are some major themes that go through, regardless of where we are in kind of our historical track and also taking in um, our individual institution track of five key identifiers, space, staff, partnerships, process, and funding. Now, I'd probably argue if I ask and raised hands, how many of these are key factors for everybody here? And I hopefully would get every, every hand. If we didn't, I'd like to talk to those people. Um, but so we took this and postulated or hypothesized that um, this would be kind of a linear path. Once you check one of these things off, you could say, okay, I've done that. I've got, I've got my space, I've got my process, and I don't really need to revisit those anymore. I'm gonna continue on through the, through the maturity of the center. But what we found was it was more of a circular path. And I just put our circuit diagram down there to show that, that each one of these points you have to revisit as, as, the, as your center grows and matures. And should one break or should somebody flip a switch, you have to go back and kind of rethink that piece of the path. Um, and as more projects come through, I make the analogy that it's just more electricity coming through the circuit. Um, you may need a couple more transistors or something to hold that, but um, it doesn't really change. You can't say I'm never going to deal with process anymore because it's ever, ever changing. So now fast forward to my colleagues here with me today. And we were trying to think of some ways to map those experiences on a framework um, that we use. Um, and I started with internal, internal focus on our framework. We have to have transparency. You can see not only in the arrangement of the physical space, but literally in the way that we record research project assistance. Uh, where the faculty member is, where, what all we did, where are the GIS maps, where does the database live, is it in the Amazon space, is it local, um, who's, do, who's done the work on it. So huge transparency to be able to share that across our internal institution. We also have to have transparency on the relationship between us and the faculty. Uh, for example, how adept that they are using some of the technologies we have. Uh, what is their particular interest in this broader, broader work? Uh, what, 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 what is that criteria? One, two, three, what's their highlights? And that feeds to communications within our internal team and also within the external team. We're actually our own entity within the larger library and information technology services umbrella at Emory. So there's the library, there's core IT systems, the PeopleSoft and the, and the network, there's healthcare IT, and there's us. So we are purposefully this small little group uh, in this large, large organization to draw from external assets. So for example, when I need uh, software development, in fact, we have uh, 1.8 FTE right now working on our application development from the IT side of the house. If I need help with metadata, I go to the metadata librarian on the library side of the house. Um, intellectual property, I go to the, to the library. And this way allows us to be flexible. So I don't have to hire people on when I get a grant or get work and then fire or lay them off. And hopefully the experiences they learn within the center also will equate to something that they can take back to their home institution. And I'll talk about some of the challenges with that as well here in a second. And assessment, which is always the key, right? How do you know what you're doing is making an impact? Um, UNC Libraries has this great scholarly metrics page that lists many, many of the factors that we take into account. Uh, award social networking, and my colleague, my co-director before I came, he said, make sure you tell them that return business is a key indicator of how much, how much your success is. Um, and we've added think time uh, not to abuse the Google term, but for our core faculty, every week they have eight hours to think about something that's not related to their, it's not one of their duties. It is related to their work, but it's not one of their duties. Uh, because for us to be innovative and for us to look for new ways and new platforms to publish and do our work on, I've got to free up some cycles of, of the team. Um, and we have brown bags where they come back and they share what they found every semester. And actually, um, this will be the first time at the end of this fiscal year, which I will have that as one of their criteria for their evals. What, what did they bring back as part of their think time? And that can be one of the, edic the uh, indicators. And it's an experiment. We just tried it, so we'll see how it works. <coughs> Externally, like I mentioned, we are just one entity in a larger organization. So we have to have those relationships. We have MOUs with 
other groups. We have MOUs with our faculty project um, proposers and with our graduate project proposers as well. My faculty co-director is key. I can't say enough about the value of having a tenured faculty member there. Um, not only to, to kind of get, get the word out, but we just had a, uh, a challenging discussion about a 3D project with a faculty member. And for him to be there and talk about what, what they were trying to do with their research was invaluable. Um, so it's been a very, very good, he's 60% still in history and 40% with the center. Uh, partnerships, um, we have librarians be uh, consultants on our project eval meetings. Um, we have the subject matter librarians come in who have been working with the faculty. We all sit around the table and say, is this a good project or not? What do we need to do? Um, so in, in the consultation phase they're there and in the production phase, as I said, phase, as I said, to work with the people who digitization, the people who help us with our programming, uh, the storage folks, the archival folks. Um, impact, again, is a key thing. In this case, uh, with external focus, it's been where work that we've done has been so successful that I've been having to ask for more time from people. So with resource scarcity, you can imagine how some of those asks kind of have to be changed as far as time phase. Um, I can't always get everybody I want to be able to work on a project when I can. So we kind of have to be flexible on that because things are so, are so resource tight right now. Uh, and then archiving, we are, we're at our library, we're, we're working towards Hydra. Um, I know a lot of digital scholarship centers offer library repository as a carrot to get faculty projects in. Um, and open resources too, OERs and things like that are things that we're going to take full advantage of um, to be able to share some of these things outside of our institution. And lastly for me, um, the link to modern, what we're calling modern scholarship. With some of our principles that we're practicing around the idea of public scholarship, taking hidden collections and bringing them forward, visualizing materials that we may not have copyright for, but yet adds a new area of exposure to researchers and scholars. Um, student engagement is also a big one. Um, the ability to have undergraduates, we have a whole program where they uh, get micro-credentials for finishing different levels of achievement. And it's been very, very um, successful in the fact that we get relatively cheap and quantified labor for our projects. And they get to put things on their CV that say, I worked on this project and here it is online. And in fact, I was a project coordinator for it. And I can tell you exactly the dynamics that took, took place in that, in that meeting. Um, and cross-institutional partner, uh, partnerships, like I mentioned with Georgia State, and our colleagues there, we have three or two ongoing projects right now and hopefully have many more. Um, in fact, we're opening that one um, <coughs> virtual Atlanta to crowdsourcing, so we hopefully we get a lot, of, a lot of people to work on that. Um, those seem to resonate to the funders today. And I know it's very, very tight to get funding with some of the agencies right now. Uh, but we've been very blessed with the, lately the, the, the Voyages project, the slave trade tracking project that we're redoing. Um, that has um, received a NEH grant um, to actually redo the whole thing. Um, with innovation, we're moving to the cloud now. Uh, we're moving actually production systems to the cloud in the Amazon space. Um, for example, our Southern Spaces um, journal recently updated to Drupal 7, and they were about to go live. They switched it all on. It was up in Amazon Web Space. They had made a last minute change. Of course, that broke one section of the site. So they quickly sent us a copy without it. My colleague, uh, my coworker, spun that up on another instance in AWS, switched the other one off, and within 20 minutes, we had a brand new instance up and running that was functioning correctly. Um, and even with virtual machines, that would be tough to make that 30 minute timeline and have that flexibility. And of course, that equates to cost. So be able to switch things off when you don't need them and spin them up when you do has been a huge cost factor. Um, and resource constraints, like I mentioned, sustainability, even with the Voyages project, um, that, was re that was done in 2007, so now it's 2016, and we're trying to figure out for care and feeding of these projects that we have in-house, how do you fund for the next change in 2024? How does that work? What's it going to be like? Uh, we try to empower most of the faculty to take their projects and go with them. Uh, we give them sustainable platforms, we're there to help but we can't maintain all of these projects in the house because we wouldn't have any bandwidth to do anything else. And that really speaks to innovation. Uh, being able to be agile, innovate, bring in new thought, try things, 
be willing to fail sometimes and record that, but be willing to be able to move and bring things through existing platforms using our resources across the university to really, to really make it work. And I think, is that it? So that's my contact information, digitalscholarship.emory.edu or ecds.emory.edu and wayne.morse at emory and I'm happy to answer questions and um, give more information. There's lots more information about our projects on our website. So with that, you want to open it up to questions, comments, concerns?